Hi, uh, welcome to Film Tracks, episode 18. We have a really awesome special guest for you today. That's right, 18th, our 18th episode for today's show. Jesse and I are very pleased to have Mike Knobloch be, be our guest. As the president of Film Music at Universal Pictures, he's responsible for all creative and production aspects of Universal's film scores, songs, and soundtracks. He also oversees the administration of licensing of Universal's publishing catalog, which is awesome. He's overseen music's, music for dozens and dozens of films, some at Fox and now at Universal, and perhaps you've heard of some of these. Avatar, Walk the Line, Crazy Heart, Battleship, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, Fight Club, Snow White and the Huntsman, Kingdom of Heaven, Sunshine, the list goes on and on. Stay tuned, you do not want to miss this show. Hosting and bandwidth for Trigla is provided by Media Temple. We're back. Episode 18. Week 18 of Film Tracks. If this is the first time you're joining us, Jesse and I bring on composers and music specialists relating to or talking about film scores. Our job is to inspire and talk about why film music is important, um, not only personally, but the way it relates to the images we see on the screen. And today we are very, very pleased to have an awesome guest with us, the president of film music at Universal Pictures, Mike Knobloch is on our show. Thank you, Mike, for being with us today. Hey guys, how are you? <laughs> so Mike um, is actually at Universal right now, and he's been very, very nice to be able to Skype in um, during his busy schedule to talk with us today. And so I think it's important to have Mike on the show because a lot of people don't really understand how the film music world works. They just buy the CDs, you know, or they see the mu they see the movie, and they're like, "Oh, this is film music. This is awesome." But um, I think Mike to start off maybe to just kind of break some ground, is to talk about what exactly it is that you do at Universal, and how did you get there? I, I don't know how much time we have, <laughs> but I will, I'll try to cover those two questions. Um, what do I do, and how did I get here? Can we cover those separately? We'll yes. start with what do I do. Like you very eloquently said, in a way that made me feel a little bit old, um, <laughs> I oversee all aspects of music for all the films that are made and distributed by Universal Pictures. So that covers a, a, a pretty wide spectrum of oversight. Um, like you pointed out, it could be hiring uh, the right composer and overseeing the, uh, the creative development and the production aspects and the financials, and that's an important one, the financials, of executing a score. Mm -hmm. um, if, depending on the movie, I mean, everything is sort of driven by the unique requirements of each film. That we make. So, um, if we're working on a film that's particularly song driven, then obviously we'll work with the director and the rest of the filmmakers and the rest of the executives here at the studio um, to realize the best version of the film from the perspective of putting in the right songs, whether they're licensed songs or original songs. Um, and uh, Pretty much every movie I've ever worked on has a composer and a score as well. So it's some combination of songs and score. Songs could be something as simple as somebody singing Happy Birthday uh, on camera in mm -hmm. a film, or it could be more complicated. You mentioned Walk the Line or you know a movie like that, Walk the Line, Moulin Rouge uh, was another one I worked on, or Scott Pilgrim you also mentioned, um, something where you have actors... Uh, of, of any genre or period playing instruments and singing and and just the mechanics of how that works and the creative of what you know sometimes you'll read in a script uh the band gets up and plays a rousing number and everybody goes crazy and it's like a sentence in a script that could that right there could spark uh you know months of work and you know and and endless amounts of uh, of dollar signs so uh from the very get-go we dig in and 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 try to assess the needs of the film, work with the filmmakers, gauge everyone's appetite and expectations accordingly, and deliver the best possible music that we can for the film. So um, that's, that's a pretty simplified overview just on the um, film and production side of things. In my department, we also administrate our 
uh, publishing catalog, which is this studio's uh, catalog from the whole history of the studio. So Universal Pictures is right now celebrating its centennial year. So for a hundred years of movie making, right. most of which had sound in pictures, we have a rich publishing catalog. We administrate that as well, and that drives some of our revenue when we license things out and just from the performance of our catalog. So I oversee our publishing as well, and um, and I, I could keep talking, but that's that's I, that's a pretty broad overview of uh, of what I'm responsible for oversight wise. That's pretty awesome. So do you do you actually so when you have a filmmaker come in, let's say they they you know Universal's making a movie, and I'm a director, and I say I really want and Neo Morricone and to be, you know, I, I wrote this script and this is like the composer for me. Um, do they eventually talk to you about uh, about this issue and like then you have to take that desire and kind of compute it in financials and see if it works, you know, within the script or what everybody else wants at the studio? Yeah, it's pretty much everything you just said, which, you know, then engages a, a, a kind of a, a pretty multifaceted uh, version of my role in the whole process, whether I'm a, you know, a referee or, a, you know, psychoanalyst or, or a facilitator or, you know, one thing or another. It's mm -hmm. it, like you said, it's breaking down what could be a really bold statement is I want Ennio Morricone to score my picture. And then that just kicks off a series of questions that need to be asked and answered. Is that creatively is Enyo who is, you know, a living legend. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're making a movie that, you know, is about the electronic music dance scene, you know, and, uh, <laughs> it, it might it, not work. It, it may, it may not work, awesome. although <laughs> you know, Enyo could probably do anything. And that movie might have some emotional beats that need some kind of warmth and traditional conventional, uh, uh, you know, conventions employed and everything. Maybe Enyo's a genius call for that. Mm -hmm. Um Sometimes it's the other way around. Instead of I want Enyo to score my movie, you know, I want, you know, the bass player from my favorite band who's never scored a movie before to score my movie. And again, is that a good idea? Is it a good idea creatively? We do some risk assessment. Is that mm -hmm. a good, you know, um, can we sleep well at night knowing that that's the composer at the helm of that project? And then some other things that have to be asked and answered as well. Is it, uh, uh, can we afford that person? Um, and then there's much, you know, some lower level issues that on a project for project basis, um, have to get work through. Do we, you know, what kind of deal is the is the movie overall, and is there any kind of funky tax credit or requirement that will dictate? Well, we actually need to do the work in a in a certain country or a certain territory, and is it union or not union? Is it our production or are we just the distributor, and we're we're helping another production entity that may not be a signatory to to union players, and and um, you know you get into the finer points of it, and someone might say. You know, I want Enya, and we might say, actually, you know, we need an American composer, or vice versa, or um, you know, it becomes an availability. You know, we might sort it all out and check all the check boxes and go, great, Enya's the guy. We can afford him. Everybody loves the idea. It's brilliant for the film and all of that. And then we make right. the phone call and find out Enya's not available. Right. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it could be any uh, permutation of all the different variables, and then we just, you know, kind of take the issues as they come and we, we problem solve most of the time we're in problem solving mode I think it's awesome because I think it's great that you're talking about all these details because I just think that our viewers and people who love film scores like us like we're just as fans don't recognize the nuts and bolts and the logistics that go into actually getting to a point where you you're sitting in a theater and you're listening to a score the sessions and the budgets for that and the nuts and bolts and logistics for even just coordinating that um, are a big thing. So do you oversee, you kind of oversee everybody in the bubble of film score, the, the scoring and the soundtrack production um, from start to finish? Yeah, I mean, typically, and there's non-conventional ways of scoring a movie as well, but the more typical scenario is there is a team that would get assembled once, you know, things fall into place. You hire James Newton Howard to score your film. You might know off the bat, James works with certain orchestrators, mixers, music editors, programmers, he prefers a certain contractor for his orchestra, he might even prefer certain players for that contractor to get in his orchestra, a whole slew of things that, um, that, like you said, we do oversee, all fall into place. And yeah, at the end of the day, it's an invisible thing. I mean, music in the pecking order of movie making, you know, we kind of, we know our, our role and where we are in the hierarchy of things. And, you know, there's, you know, there's kind of a, a, a double-sided thing where on the one hand 
um, you know, everybody in the business and everybody on the studio lot is an expert at their own job and music. Right. Which is a quote that, you know, we attribute to Alfred Newman. Um, but that's true, you know, so just kind of managing all of the, the collective of opinions and kind of figuring out who, who's, you know, who's the 800 pound gorilla and whose opinion outweighs, uh, you know, the others and all of that, that can be a tricky part of the gig as well. But at the end of the day, you know, with music, we know where we are in the pecking order. And right. there's also the scenario where, you know, some people go see a movie and the movie's amazing and they come out of the theater and, you know, one says to the yeah. other, what do you think of the movie? And they say, well, I think that movie was fantastic. And they say, what do you think of the music? And if they say, hey, you know what? I didn't I didn't really notice the music. That's a perfect answer. That could yeah. be, you know, in a lot of cases, that's great. If things are balanced and in proportion, somebody not noticing what we slave over for, you know, sometimes uh, months or years on a project, if right. at the end of the day somebody kind of shrugs it off and goes, I didn't really notice, but I loved the, the movie, well, then great. Then we've probably done a good job. If they come out kind of thinking, well, geez, man, that, that music was so in my face, I couldn't really concentrate or I couldn't hear the dialogue or I just, you know, it was so at odds with what was on the picture, on the screen, then, then we probably, you know, miscalculated somewhere mm -hmm. along the way. So, um, you know, it, for what we do, what I do uh, with my oversight of music, there are execs who handle physical production, there are execs who handle post-production, there are execs who handle visual effects, and I'm, I'm part of this, you know, huge collaborative of execs that are both kind of managing our investment from a financial perspective, we are facilitating um, in, in an artistic medium we're facilitating you know uh, and, and aiding and abetting I guess uh, filmmakers creatives who uh, who want to achieve a, a certain you know a, a realization of their vision of a film and this studio in particular here at Universal we're very filmmaker friendly mm -hmm. and we really respect a director who shows up and says this is what I want to do our role is to to get in there and and have a can-do attitude uh, attitude not you know take a position of well you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't afford it I mean we you know we really try to like I said earlier as long as the appetite and expectations are in check which is a big qualifier with music specifically because when you get into songs um, especially licensing existing pop songs, you know, it's it, it can be a big wild card in any budget. And uh, the pricing of songs, it's a very relationship driven thing. It's a very kind of vibey thing. There is no kind of um, fee schedule or scale that dictates what a song should cost. Right. So, you know, sometimes a song could cost ten thousand dollars and a song could cost a million dollars. And it doesn't mean that the other one is a 100 times better. It's just, you know, it's like real estate. A song is worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So um, it, that part can be a very tricky thing. We've we've just finished some movies. Um, American Reunion, which was the fourth right. in the American Pie series. That song, that movie had um, 64. Wow licensed songs in it it's a lot That's think about it from the beginning of the process we're working with filmmakers and may they might approach every one of those 64 spots saying well i want this here and i want this here and i want this here and we go okay well that one cleared but these others um either either, either they're too expensive or you know in some cases they might get denied we go try to get permission to use a song and mm -hmm. the, the owner of the song or the artist might just say no i don't like the way you're using my song or i'm not interested in taking your money for that use and so if we have 60 something songs in a movie for every one of those song spots, we might clear two, three, five, ten songs per spot. So at the end of the day, there's kind of a big machinery here in motion, um, overseeing and supervising the films and, and trying to, to help get it all done. And, you know, sometimes it's about managing the budget. Um, you know, if we have 64 songs, kind of figuring out these are the spots that are worth spending on and these are the ones where you can barely hear it or it's more of a utilitarian kind of song and we could find something kind of on the cheap in those spots to, to help move some more of the money into the spots that, that really matter for some, some brand name stuff. So, you know, all different kinds of factors and criteria uh, at play in, in making it work. So when, when you think about that, for the requirements of each film and at any given time, working on a couple dozen movies in one phase of production or another, um, that, that keeps us pretty busy around the clock. I see. And so is that, you mentioned that in terms of overseeing, um, overseeing songs for each film, is that where music supervisors come in? Because I know, I know that Jesse is kind of like on the music supervision end, and um, she had a couple of questions about that. 
Sure. Um, I'm happy to field your questions, but in short, the answer is um, sometimes, depending on the requirements of the film and the preferences of the filmmakers, we might hire an independent supervisor if the, if the project really merits the kind of the day to day uh, supervision, somebody dedicated to that film full time and sitting next to the director in the cutting room on a day to day basis. Um, if it's that kind of a project and we have the money and it all all those things that I talked about line up, right. then, yeah, we'll hire a supervisor and then we supervise the supervisors in a very kind of hands-on and collaborative uh, way and other times depending on the requirements of the film um, I have a team of people here and we function as in-house music supervisors so you know we we work with uh, closely with the filmmakers but um, you know sometimes we can step out of our role as studio execs and really be more on the creative side and and be on you know squarely on the filmmakers camp which some some filmmakers can be a little suspicious of studio execs getting a little bit too in their business but i i think we balance it well and and, and really uh, come off as genuine partners uh, with the filmmakers that we work with very very cool and um i actually would like to talk a little bit about what you mentioned earlier in terms of universal centennial because i think this is important i mean all of us have grown up watching universal movies from um, from you know all of all of Spielberg's films, and then of course you know seeing the intro logo, and I know it's been completely revamped. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the original guy who scored the Universal theme was Jerry Goldsmith, I think. Well, sure. Although uh, I don't know. Universal, uh, maybe unlike some of the other studios, um, uh, or maybe you know like Fox, for example, has a logo that goes back almost as far as the entire history of the studio, right. uh, which is very much their signature tune. The Jerry Goldsmith logo for Universal that you're used to hearing and familiar with, it only goes back about 15 years. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so uh, Jerry did write it, and you're putting me on the spot, and off the top of my head, I am spacing on which movie in particular. I'm sure the second we're done with this interview, I'll go, oh, that's what the logo is for. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, when you say completely revamped, we actually, we did a new recording of it. Brian Tyler, who we had just worked with on Fast Five. That's right. Um, he came in, and he and I talked about how to do a new recording and a slightly new arrangement so that we could evolve it, but be very true to Jerry's composition uh, in a way that if Jerry were here, he would hopefully be proud of. So, mm -hmm. and Brian, who, who is a real student of, uh, of Jerry's music and, uh, and knew Jerry. Um, it was, it was cool to, uh, you know, and a, a huge thing to entrust Brian with yeah, I'm sure. uh, and to take on myself as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that um, we made some very minor tweaks to the logo and got some of the world's best players and singers. We added a choir. We added per some percussion stuff that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I'm pretty proud of how we um, evolved the logo uh, for the for the company's centennial. And, and I'm sure it's not the last time that 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 logo will be either re rearranged or or re-recorded. But you know that was a very historic thing to be a part of. And speaking of which, we have a little YouTube clip that is awesome. It's a couple minutes long, and it's a behind the scenes look at the making of this 100th anniversary logo with Brian Tyler. And I actually think, Mike, you're in it for just like a split second. I am in it for a split <laughs> So here, let's check it out. And um, it's pretty awesome. The Universal logo has been around for so long and it's so iconic. My task was to take on this great theme and, and do something new with it. We want to utilize the classic melody that we all know and bring it into the 21st century, but still really be respectful of what Jerry Goldsmith had originally written. Okay, let's roll it. I want it to be a celebration of all the great movies Universal's done over the years. Connecting the past with the present, the main line that we've always heard in the, the horns, that's still there. But you have the movement of the music underneath it. I had a few sneak peeks at the visuals that were being worked on. The globe coming in and the, the letters spinning around and seeing the cityscapes. That was a huge influence for me to add choir. There's also kind of a sparkly, shimmery type of thing throughout the piece that I've done with violins. And it gives it a kind of the magic feel. And at the end of the piece, I have a whole drum cadence. The thing that I think people really latch onto is the bass drum there. I use drums from around the world, like djembe's and, and African drums. And I thought that was kind of a nice way to bring that idea of 
Universal Pictures being global. Very nice. <laughs> Give me chills. It's pretty incredible that every time I now see a film by Universal, I'll hear the logo music that I'd conducted. It cues you in to say, okay, put away the phone, stop eating your popcorn for a split second, pay attention. It's a huge honor. Came out really great. Yeah, it came out rad, and I. It, it's... That was awesome. I didn't know you guys were going to play that, but I just really enjoy. I haven't seen that in a while, so I. I, I really we were actually enjoyed. just joking. We were saying, "I'll bet you've seen this like a billion and one times." And... I have seen it a billion and one times, but not recently. So I actually thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, well, that's awesome. I think it's like great to see kind of behind the scenes and like the sessions and kind of like listening to the composers talk about how they have to live up to Jerry's, you know, kind of original plan and um, it must have been kind of an honor to, to have to redo that. I think it w was would have been really awesome. So, I mean, I love what we did and you just got a glimpse in those clips of where I prefer to spend as much of my time as possible, which is in a recording studio with the world's best players and that was, we did that at, uh, at Sony's uh, legendary and historic score uh, stage which was back in the day the MGM stage where they scored everything from you know Gone with the Wind and Wizard of Oz to you know today's films and but those there's only a few of those rooms left so you know we even though it's Sony's room we get to rent it as a client and uh, we use that's one of the the bit that and Fox and Warner's are the only studios that have their own rooms left so um, I, I love being in any one of those three rooms and spending time with with some of the, the most talented people on the planet so how long did that take to complete would you say from like inception to being just done? that logo yeah um, a few months from yeah. when Brian and I first started huh. talking about it he had got for what 30 seconds of music not even oh yeah no I mean we went away um, we, we started from just the conversational kind of conceptual theoretical what would we do mm -hmm. if we were going I mean it was it was a big if in the first place like you know it was an idea that I put out there to the to uh, the folks that I work with at the studio, um, just saying, what what do you think of this? And um, you know, this is something that we could do as part of the centennial celebration. And um, you know, it was a bit of an experiment. Uh, you know, Brian demoed it up about a dozen different ways and took that composition and tried to kind of push it in directions that, it, 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 by trying that, you know, you realize directions it, it clearly didn't want to go. So you know, we sort of figured out what what would work and what wouldn't by some trial and error and we locked in on that in demo form and then I took that demo and had to get the uh, the chairman of the studio and the, the, the other executives involved just on board with it based on Brian's demo which is a pretty kind of low impact way to get a taste of what something's going to sound like but by no means a substitute for the real thing and then we had to budget it out and see if there was an appetite to spend that as much like you know working on a film but really on a one cue basis. <laughs> And um, so, you know, to fire up that room with that orchestra and that choir um, and the technical personnel uh, that were a big part of it and everything, you know, it was a, a big thing for, like you pointed out, 30 seconds or 25 seconds of music. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that's a, a microcosm of what we do times, you know, enough minutes of music to score a whole picture uh, on a regular basis. So it was, it, was, it was pretty fun and it did feel important and historic uh, when we were there recording it. So, you know, hopefully we'll see. I don't know how long I'll be the head of music at Universal, hopefully for as long as they'll have me, <laughs> but um, we'll see, you know, uh, how long that, that particular version of the logo holds up. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and actually, I um, want to definitely talk about, you've, you've had kind of a busy uh, summer. Universal's had a busy summer this year with some major summer movies. You had Battleship and Snow White and the Huntsman, and then I think Savages was the was the next one as well. Um, sure, Snow White was kind of our spring into summer movie. Battleship, like you mentioned, Savages, um, which is still in theaters. Ted, which that's is right, a, Ted. A, something yeah. we made in partnership with a company called MRC, but a movie we distributed, which is sort of uh, clearly 
the comedy of the summer, if not the year. So mm -hmm. assuming that you've seen that and all the people watching this will rush out to the theater if they haven't already to see Ted, which is... <laughs> my mom so loved it. Yeah. My mom. Your mom did? My mom. She, she sent me a text That's message good. immediately. Being like, it might have been awkward if we were sitting next to your mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I wasn't. Together. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's, it's always busy. I think the business may be back in a different era was more seasonal and there were times of the year when things were quiet and times... But, you know, every weekend of movie releases is so dense that it doesn't it's not really seasonal, doesn't really ever slow down for us. And if it does, it gets gets a little scary, maybe. Um, mm. But, um, you know, mm. we're already we're working on the current batch of movies that take us into releases going into 2014. So, wow. um, you know, the, the we're right now we're kind of up to our eyeballs in uh, post production on Les Mis, which is coming out this That's December. Right. Um, that has Russell Crowe and uh, Russell Crowe. That's Russell Crowe's movie, right? Russell Crowe, Anne Hathaway, uh, Hugh Jackman, Amanda Seyfried, Eddie Redmayne, right. um, and I'm forgetting. So uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, mm -hmm. Helena Bonham Carter, and um, a, a, an amazing, amazing cast and some pretty bold um, uh, methodology choices on, on making the movie. Tom Hooper really wanted a live, genuine, gritty feel so everybody's been singing live on camera they just wrapped a couple weeks ago so uh wow. very very exciting and kind of groundbreaking on putting that one together mm -hmm. uh judd apatow finished a comedy recently that's coming out at the end of the year called this is 40 which is a spin-off of the the leslie mann and uh, paul rudd characters from right. knocked up right. so um awesome movie and um it, you know kind of goes on and on and on we have a a, a very music driven film coming out this fall called pitch perfect which is about um, competing college a cappella groups, mm -hmm. which is really funny huh. um, and a really kind of funny uh, ca an ensemble cast Good with. Uh, yeah. um, well, I'll, you know, I could plug. I could sit here and plug all our. Movies. I know it's yeah. awesome. I, I don't I, want to burn through all, all of our time, but well, uh, we have a pretty rich slate of, of movies of all shapes and sizes. Um, in terms of Snow White and the Huntsman, I know James Newton Howard scored that, which was a great choice, by the way. I thought it was a great score and soundtrack. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the end credits, because Florence and the Machine um, did the end credits song, and I think that was the first time I had heard her do um, you know, a song in a film. Right. And so was that something that you kind of... Was, that some, was the genesis of using Florence and the Machine, is that something that happened... Kind of naturally, or did the did the you know director kind of know or want that her to be in, um, in the film? Well, about the Florence song in particular, and I, I will put it out there just in case people watch the show and start googling things. It's the second time she's done a song for a movie. I believe she had a second end title song in one of the Twilight films. Oh, really? Um, I didn't know that. I, I think it's I, good music so, in the Twilight. So I'm too. told. <laughs> um, but first time for uh, I mean, as opposed to one of many on a soundtrack, this it's the it was the only. Um, Contemporary song in Snow White. There was a uh, there were a couple of uh, more sort of period tunes uh, right. in the film um, in, the, in the body of the film. But yeah, I mean, we were um, barely you know a third of the way through uh, making Snow White, and Rupert Sanders is a, an amazing director and a, a real creative visionary at the helm. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uh, putting a song at the end of the movie was not on his radar at all. And I'd gone to him early on and said, "Hey, is this something?" Just before I'd even gotten to the part where I wanted to pitch him Florence, um, just conceptually, the idea of going to any artist for any song, um, I, I hit him up early about that idea and he was not really that into it. It just wasn't on his radar and it didn't factor into his vision of the film. Um, but as he got further and further along making the film, it kind of became clear to me that if we were going to go to anyone out there um, of all the artists that anybody could come up with, um, Florence and the Machine was just a super exciting idea for me. I just, you know, as a fan of her music and just as a as a somebody overseeing the business side of things, it just the idea of it really fit. Mm -hmm. And so I became um, maybe a little bit annoying, I'm certainly <laughs> relentless and persistent with Rupert and Joe Roth uh, as the producer and other and Sam Mercer and other people at the helm of that film and just saying, look, um, aside from what it would do creatively for the film, it would be a great asset for the campaign. And um, and, and doing a song like that, um, it's a really difficult thing to do. Um, marketing typically, um, they lean towards familiar, recognizable songs yeah, for, yes. in terms of things that can hook people in yeah. a short period of time and work in a commercial or a trailer, um, which is why, you know, you see, you know, Brick House and Walking on Sunshine and, and, you know, every other, you know, 
commercial for a movie you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those the second you hear one note of, of songs like that and they instantly hook you and tell you a lot about what the film is and everything. So an original song for marketing is a bit of a dicier gamble and a big investment to make. And, you know, sometimes, you know, market marketing, they, they won't commit to something um, un until they try it and test it against other things and all of that. So, you know, it, it's, it is a big leap of faith. And, and um, you know, sometimes it works and a lot of times it doesn't. And the Florence thing and Snow White in particular, it was one of those rare um, confluence of a lot of variables. And we had a movie that was at just the right intersection of creative and cool. Yeah. To hook an artist that was at mm -hmm. just the right intersection of creative and cool. It was credible for the fans of both the movie and the and Florence the artist. And she was at just the right point in the trajectory of her career. And you know, for me it didn't really hurt things that she had done a song for uh, the Twilight series. Mm -hmm. um, nobody else seemed to be bothered by I that. As far as, you know, kind of <laughs> uncharted territory with an artist. And um, and then we once it was all lined up, it's just something people were willing to try. Um, then getting her to, you know, watch the film and come up with a song that was crafted for the film and spoke to it thematically, mm -hmm. both lyrically and worked for it musically. We very much wanted to achieve something that was an organic fit and she worked with uh, James Newton Howard who, who ultimately did it, yeah. the um, orchestral and the choir arrangement so that when it comes in at the end of the film it feels like it's meant to be there it doesn't feel like something that was tacked on it, it, it feels organic to the film and it has the same kind of style and sound as the music that's been scoring the film for the for the entire time and mm -hmm. so making all that happen and lining those all those things up um, is just an incredibly challenging thing to do but I think we really pulled it off well on Snow White and by the way I didn't even mention going to an artist who is available and interested and affordable and at the right point in her uh, album cycles that it can be fit into her record company's agenda all of those things have to line up to make a movie song work out mm -hmm. and uh, all that can be really difficult so it, it makes it all the more rewarding when when it works out but I'm, I'm really really of all the movies and songs that I've worked on um, that was a, a real on a very short list of big highlights for me and one ones that I'm really proud of so thanks for bringing it up um, have like can you think of times when like you really wanted something to happen but for whatever reason like it it, it didn't happen, like specific examples? Yes, I can think of more of those examples. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the ones we just talked about. Sure. I mean, um, you know, you mentioned Battleship and Battleship. Um, it started off the same way. Actually, more so there was a lot of pressure and a lot of appetite and desire for um, a big rock song for Battleship. Huh. And um, from very from from the very, very early conceptual stages of making that movie, um, there there was a, a push from marketing and from partnerships. We were in business on the movie with Coke Zero and they were very interested in a, a rock song as an asset and we looked at bands that meant something globally and when you right there that you just take those criteria of a movie like Battleship and a rock band that means something globally all of a sudden it's a short list yeah it's a short mm -hmm. list and and we could do it now and start kind of spitballing like what about this band and what about that that band who's available who can we get who hasn't really done a big movie song ever or lately um and Battleship was one where it was the opposite of the Florence thing in that everybody wanted it, whereas in Florence they weren't sure and very tentative about it. And um, we really tried, and, and I, don't, I don't really want to kind of tip my hand too much, but right. we did get into business with a big global brand of a band that we're going to do a song, and just for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. you know, we just got to a point where we realized um, just creatively it just it wasn't fitting and it wasn't working, and on a lot of levels, um, we um, we just ended up, you know, saying, you know what, uh, let's just let's just go without it, and all kinds of other complications and issues on on Battleship, and people may be looking at that movie going, well, Rihanna was in the movie, why didn't she do a song? Yeah. A lot of That's, people have been asking know, that. We, yeah. we went through that for a long period of time as well. So, you know, all kinds of factors uh, impact uh, those, those kinds of things. And, you know, the, the I, I, by the way, on Battleship, I still think Steve Jablonski did an amazing score. We had an amazing, amazing uh, mm -hmm. collection of, of songs in the film from ACDC to more contemporary stuff. And um, I'm actually really proud of that movie, too, and excited about how it turned out. It just didn't end up having uh, a new big original song to go with it. Yeah, well, you know, I actually, my wife and I saw a Battleship in the theater. We were kind of stoked about it because I had worked on the film and it was like a big film. And, you know, I had left Universal right before, you know, the summer was going to be released. And um, 
So we went to see it in the theater, and the first, the first thing I noticed about it was how the soundtrack completely kicked ass. I mean, it was a really awesome soundtrack. Thanks. And by the end, you know, I won't spoil it for anybody who's watching and hasn't seen it, but by the end, it's, very, it's a very music-driven film. I mean, there are certain points where, you know, the climax of the film or the climax of the third act is very driven by the musical choices that are in it. Sure. Um, and I also think that um, I read in Variety, and in fact, I have the Variety article for those of you watching or, or get you this. You are so prepared um, for this interview. It's on May 17th. There was a very, very cool article that actually features you, Mike, about um, your comments about sound design and um, the rock music that was in it. But also, on the previous page, there's a whole section on um, Steve Jablonski as well, which is pretty cool. I mean, to, to be able to read news that's about film scores. And, is, that, um, is that the issue where he got kind of celebrated as a billion dollar composer? Or <laughs> was that a different yeah, issue? Of no, no, no. This is the one where he's basically saying how, yeah, like, billion dollar composer. He yeah. wanted Zimmer. Um, yeah. He originally wanted Zimmer. I think uh, Peter Berg wanted Zimmer, but then somebody said that, you know, Jablonski would be perfect for it. And uh, yeah, Hans to... said it. There was an early conversation where, where Pete Berg did reach out to Hans and. Um, I don't. I think Hans was tied up, or I don't remember exactly what it was. But it was Hans's endorsement of Steve Jablonski that that was, uh, you know, a, a big thing for Pete Berg. And um, you know, Steve was uh, somebody that I put in front of Pete, and I put them in a room together. And I'm, I'm a big fan of just uh, composers and directors making a personal connection and getting in a room together and just talking about stuff. And I, I'm kind of anti you know, pitching a direct, sorry, pitching a composer to a director and then just having that composer go on IMDb and say, well, what's he done? And let me, oh, I don't like those movies, so he's oh. not a composer for me, yeah. which, you know, uh, that happens sometimes. And, and that's a little disheartening if that does, you know, take good composers out of the running because, you know, like I said, you know, it's it's as much about the personal connection and it's, you know, it's a bit of a, a matchmaking service that we provide to mm -hmm. to get a director and a composer in a room and both as human beings, see if there are people who hit it off together. They're going to be spending a lot of time together, and they have to have the right kind of sensibilities and, and instincts and, and also just enjoy each other's company. And, um, you know, that, that's yeah. a tall order. But Steve, Steve is, um, I became aware of Steve Jablonski on, uh, when he was doing Live from Baghdad, which I think was an HBO huh. thing, which was years ago as he was coming up through the Hans Zimmer remote control uh, group. And um, I, was, I was really excited about... Um, the kind of stuff that Steve was doing and, and always wanted to work with him. And Battleship was uh, one of the first times that I really just got to kind of sort of put him in a room with the director and, mm -hmm. you know, with other things like the Hans endorsement and everything, just get him in there. And, and he's amazing. Really kind of cool, um, calm, cool, and collected, which is an important thing for a composer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Grounded, level-headed, even-keeled. And, you know, it's a tough thing to be a composer as an artist who, you know, has to systematically, as they create their art, have other people come into their room and look at it and basically just point out everything that they don't like about it and what they want changed. And right. the composer has to kind of sort of um, maybe lobby for things they feel strongly about, but more often probably just kind of sort of with a smile on their face say, you okay. know, all right, man, I'll, yeah. I'll change that. And that's a hard thing to do. Steve's really good at it, as are a lot of other uh, top composers. Well, I think that those of you who are watching who haven't seen Battleship, definitely it's a movie that you have to see in the theater. I recommend it. Specifically, yeah, if, for if, you, if you and Jesse could maybe have millions of friends that you could influence uh, to, to rush out and get their hands on on Battleship. I think it's still playing. I don't even know if it's still playing at the arc. I, I don't think. I don't think. Well, so. I, don't think I think so. maybe from maybe, this though. Part, we could start a petition. <laughs> Bring it back. It'll be like Star Wars. It was just. I think it just came out at the wrong time. I don't. I. I we saw it and we, we were totally stoked by the end. I was like, this is a great movie. I think I was so happy with the soundtrack, um, and how awesome it was. And my question for you, Mike, is that. Um, you have a score release, or there is a score release of this soundtrack. Um, yes. Why is it that some soundtracks aren't released, like a, a VA um, soundtrack of like the ACDC songs, or the you know I think there was like the Stone Temple Pilots on there as well. Sure. Is that just? Um, well, look, the the landscape. I mean, it's a whole other conversation. Maybe we'll do a, another interview okay. about soundtracks and the record business. Um, you know, the landscape of uh, the record business in general, but especially soundtracks, has changed so drastically over the last decade and change where we went from a time, you know, pre-iTunes, which if we can remember back that far, um, you know, know, in the heyday of soundtracks, there was a real value uh, for the, the, you know, the price of one record of a soundtrack compilation. You could go get, you know, 12 or 15 songs 
that were all good that you you know otherwise you you couldn't get them a la carte you know mm -hmm. sound iTunes showed up and just digital technology in general and the way we consume media and do or don't pay for it these days and streaming versus downloadable and all the other things that we're now familiar with that are technologically uh, available to us um, the value of a compilation really changed. So specifically with what you mentioned, like we had a movie and we used, you know, an ACDC song or a Stone Temple Pilot song. Um, is it a good investment for a record label to partner with us and take those existing songs and put them on a soundtrack and get people to buy them? Well, the first there's the issue of do people buy music in general at all these days? Right. But with those things in particular, if they are an ACDC fan, they might already have those songs, or they can I go see. buy the ACDC record, or they can go to ACDC's album on iTunes and buy the songs a la carte. So there isn't that compulsion factor to get the soundtrack for that particular movie that has all those great songs mm -hmm. that exist already out in the world. And, and even if you're inclined to buy them as opposed to go to Spotify and just stream them when you want to hear them, um, then, um, you know, it, it just it's just not as compelling. So... We do soundtracks for movies when it makes sense, and when it makes sense these days is when you have something that's unique, mm -hmm. um, whether it's songs or scores or both. Um, you know, if you wanted the Florence and the Machine song, you could only get it from us. It didn't; it wasn't out on her record. Maybe it'll be on one of her records in the future. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll get stripped on to her current album as a end of the year bonus track edition. And we've talked about all those scenarios, and right now none of that's planned. But you know, all of that is possible. But um, you can get it um, either as a single download on iTunes or you can buy it as part of the Snow White soundtrack. But either right. way, you know, it exists because of Snow White. So it, it comes from us uh, as the as the movie studio. Um, an existing song compilation just isn't, you know, it's, it's not as viable of a business model. But then we have movies like The Lorax, which is, you know, new original songs and, you know, we have characters in the movie singing. Um, and it's practically a musical. And so if you like those songs in the Lorax, you have to go buy the Lorax soundtrack. Exactly. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't really think about the landscape and how it's changed, but you're right. I mean, over the past decade, it has changed. I mean... And just getting rights. Like, soundtrack rights are a lot harder to obtain than, you know, just... Well, rights. yeah, yeah, yes, and no. But I mean, I, you know, I. Why don't you guys put out on your site a uh, a survey of people just to find out when was the last time they bought music and in what form? And I think that would enlighten a lot of the, you know, the, help contextualize this conversation because I just don't think people are buying music the way that they used to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm of the age where I grew up as a collector of analog media. And then as a digital consumer, I still have kind of an a, an analog collector's mentality. So I have a hard drive. My iTunes collection is like my record collection, and it's a digital uh, collection of files that live on a drive um, that I've collected. But that's because I'm, I'm I'm a music collector in in the way that I consume music. I think you know, kind of younger generations um, are more about just availability, and with the cloud, uh, you know, technology and everything, it doesn't matter. I don't think there's that kind of collector mentality to own music. And collect it in that way, um, in, a, in a, a tactile. Whether even if it's a file on a hard drive, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just think there's so many ways between YouTube and Spotify and more or less legitimate ways of getting your hands on something. You know, you pretty much can get anything anytime without having to pay for it. Yeah, so my kids are not growing up really thinking they don't. They don't know record stores the way I knew record stores. There right. was a day we could have stood in front of Tower Records and somebody <laughs> would have said, you know, one day this won't be here. You all would have responded, you're out of your mind. There will all, how could there not be record stores? But now we can go to different parts of town and say this used to be a record store and that used to be a record store. And, right. you know, and that's kind of scary. And, you know, X number of years ago, we wouldn't have known that. And so mm -hmm. now... You know, my kids know they can hear anything, anytime between XM and Rhapsody and uh, Spotify and YouTube and all sorts of things. Like they don't they don't think of it as like going to the store. If you want a candy bar or a T-shirt, you got to go to a store and you fork over your money and you mm -hmm. get the goods. And it's just music as a, as a commodity. Recorded music as a commodity doesn't uh, it doesn't work the way that it used to. And I think that that, you know, that has impacted soundtracks. Um, as much as, if not more so, than all other genres of music. So do you, um, do you listen to new music constantly? Are you always listening to musics or scores or looking for kind of new composers? Like how, does, like how do you discover a new composer? Do the, do they, does their manager come and say, hey, Mike, I've got a really great composer. Here's his music. Like you must get 
a sure. million demos. Sure, it can demos. be a tricky thing. I mean, there is that kind of pride of you know ownership or discovery in in being turned on to a new talent and and um, and using them, but it can be a big gamble and a big risk. And so it's hard to evaluate somebody who hasn't really done it time and time again and have the you know the experience and the knowledge from you know of of that they could apply to. Uh, to a movie that we're going to hire them for. So, um, yes, I'm always meeting with uh, emerging talent. I'm always listening to new music and meeting with artists and songwriters and producers and bands. Mm -hmm. um, but um, with composers in particular, um, you know, sometimes I might get turned on to somebody who's done a, an indie or maybe somebody else took a gamble on them and I can kind of, you know, capitalize on somebody else's risk and right. comfort in that, you know, like... Clinton Shorter um, did District 9 for... It's a uh, great score. It's a great soundtrack. And I, thought, I saw that movie and I loved the movie and I loved the score and, mm -hmm. and I said, who is this guy? Who is this Clinton Shorter guy? And he hadn't really done much other than that. Some, 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 a few things, but not, not a ton of stuff. But he did but, Contraband, right? Well, that yeah, so that stuck with me and District 9 was a few years ago at this point, but it, Clinton was on my radar for a long time and I just kind of had him on a short list of guys that, you know, when the right movie comes up in the right set of circumstances... That's a guy I want to work with, and Clinton is a, a prime example of, you know, it was a, a, a first-time director mm -hmm. and um, a, a limited budget, which a lot of times is a driver and taking those kinds of risks, and um, and it just, you know, it all worked out. Clinton met with the director, and they, they hit it off, and, and um, Clinton ultimately delivered a really, really great score. So, um, you know, that for me was a little bit, and maybe for other people, a bit of a discovery, although somebody clearly took more of a gamble on them on District 9. <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, you know, for me, the same thing. I've been aware, aware of Ramin uh, Javadi for a while, and he's done a lot of big movies, but I hadn't worked with them. And then Safe House came up, and a, a, a young director, who, a great director named Daniel Espinoza, who, um, you know, ultimately wanted to meet with a lot of different people. And I knew Ramin was going to be a good match for that one. And I got them together and that one paid off as well. So, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm clearly just focusing on the times when it all worked out great. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's hard, hard to be as, you know, as, as uh, forthcoming about the details of those circumstances. Well, as, I think, as, uh, I think, um, I think you definitely, I mean, I was looking at the resume of your films and, and most of them, you know, some of them I even, you know, I've just fell in love with in terms of the score choices or the score composer choices. And I know that so many different variables have to come together, but I think that the summer movies that Universal has released so far have been excellent in terms of the soundtrack realm. Um, I think they've been really, really, really awesome. And um, for those of you that are watching and are curious about what these sound like or what these scores sound like, you can go to our website. And I actually have, the, of course, on YouTube... Um, there are clips of these scores that Mike is talking about, Contraband and Safe House, um, that, that you can play. And if you like them, I urge you to go out and buy them on iTunes. Or I guess you can stream them on Spotify if they're there as well. I <laughs> or, urge you to go buy them on iTunes as well. <laughs> go buy them on buy iTunes. Them more times and give them out as uh, stocking stuffers this Christmas. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So... Um, I actually want to to quickly go back to um, to to Snow White and the Huntsman and the Florence and the Machine um, and the Florence and the Machine conversation because there actually is a very cool behind the scenes video that was made about it. Um, where, did you have anything to do with this behind the scenes uh, featurette that was done? Have you seen it? I'm sure you have, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm actually, you, it, it could be a bit of an Easter egg and we can challenge people later on to, and I, I wouldn't because you'd never do it, but I am actually in this video too. You, you are? I didn't I, see you in this a, one. It's a blink and you miss it thing and, and, and it's not an obvious one, so don't, don't try to find it, but yes, I've seen it. Okay, well, in that case, let's check this out. It's only a couple minutes long and it's awesome. Here we go. We've been scoring with a 110-piece orchestra for the whole of the film. This afternoon, we were just finishing a piece that Florence and the Machine have recorded. It's called Breath of Life. I was looking for a breath of life. It's more from the perspective of the Queen. The song is about Ravenna trying to get Snow White's youth and beauty. I need her heart! Snow White's the only one who can keep her alive and beautiful forever. I just thought the Queen was such a amazing character. She's literally like sucking the life out of young girls. 
there's something that is just so right about the casting of Florence and Snow White and the Huntsman. Her voice has a very modern sound. She's just got an incredibly grand, epic, classical scale to the voice. Florence and I chucked the chords down, sketched out the vocals, and put all the timpani percussion, I put some hip-hop beats in. And James then orchestrated her music. It's a great kind of symphony of modern music with an orchestra behind it. When I first heard the track, I was just bowled over by it. It's amazing to see something you've done in a tiny studio just turned into this orchestral magnificence. I've never seen my music written out on sheets before. It's sort of completely beautiful and terrifying. I'm very happy that she loved the film and, and really wanted to be a part of it. I think of the audience. I'd like them to be slightly afraid. <gasps> Okay, so there you have it. For I, I honestly couldn't see. I couldn't find you. I'm sorry. No. Watch it a hundred more times, <laughs> and, and then let think, me know. I think I'll... Jesse and I are going to have to watch it a hundred more times today, and then we'll we'll let don't, you know. You don't. You don't have to. It's not, it's... I'll let you watch it a hundred more times. So I, we're running out of time. I know um, we only have a few minutes left, and my last question for you, Mike, is, you know, as an executive overseeing all of these films that you have done, is there a specific kind of philosophy you have, um, whether it's with your department or whether it's thinking about um, approaching a project, is there something that you kind of have done over the years that's kind of like quintessentially, you know, your approach? Uh, Look, I, I think, um, yes, I th is the answer to your question. And a lot of it has very little to do with music um, or kind of stuff that you learn in school. And it's more about um, some themes that, you know, people that I work with have heard from me a lot and that I try to apply to myself in general, which is just to rely on a strong um, sense of intuition, intuition, um, people skills, being kind of tuned in to what's going on and egoless and collaborative and communicative and approach things with a solution oriented kind of um, uh, deadline oriented sense of urgency and um, and to just be the kind of person that other people want to want to be around and um, you know to, to not you know to approach things with a you know kind of no job is too small nothing's beneath you roll up your sleeves get in the trenches and do the work and it's not about nothing you never have you know you never rely or engage a, a sense of entitlement um, you know we're incredibly fortunate and lucky to have these jobs and you know I think a lot of us are here in the movie business because this is kind of like the closest you get to being in summer camp year round and, and getting paid for it um, right. it's an incredibly fun awesome thing to do and I never take that for granted and I don't think anybody should and uh, you know I just I, I show up on a daily basis and and um, you know I'm, I'm, I'm excited to figure out you know I also I get to work every day and think you know here are the 10 things that need to get done and then at 901 I get the one phone call that sets all those 10 things aside and says okay here's the the crisis du jour or the fire that needs to be put out but you know we the word look if I have a bad day at work or if I really screw something up the worst thing that happens is somebody someone puts a bad song in a movie or something like that um, <laughs> you know if, if you're a, a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon or something the consequences are a lot more severe so you know try to maintain perspective and balance and and um, and then just have a good time. That's it, I guess. Yeah. Well, I have yet to see something that's that's bad that's come out of anything that you have done. Um, but I, next I time, I can tell you some. So <laughs> that's, that'll be for the next interview. So they, those have just been your bad days. <laughs> yes, all the bad things I've done. We can talk about those another time. Well, I think that those of you who are watching, um, we are very fortunate to have Mike on the show. And of course, we all go into the theater you know, expecting some sort of magic to happen. And generally it does. And the reason why it does is primarily because of this, you know, relationship between sound and image that um, Jesse and I talk about each week. 
Um, so one of the guys that is kind of behind the magic is Mike. And thank you again, Mike, for being on our show. We really, really do appreciate it. Yes. Thanks, guys. It's been really thank good you. talking with you. And Jesse, next time, don't let Andrew do all the talking, okay? <laughs> I let you do all the talking, Mike. Okay. Yeah, don't let me do all the talking either. <laughs> thank you right, again, guys. Mike. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Appreciate and, what you're doing. And those of you watching, next week we might or may, may or may not be here. We had a guest, but they had to cancel last minute. Maybe Jesse and I will be here to talk about cool and upcoming trends and music and whatnot. Maybe we can bring in some LPs and play them. Who knows? Stay tuned. We'll be back. Film tracks. Find us on iTunes. Um, go on Spotify. Follow us. JFKLives.com. AndrewAlderetti.com. And, of course, you can always find us on Trig.LA. Um, subscribe to us and rate our show. And that's pretty much it. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye, guys.